About a year, year and a half ago, I redid my bedroom in this gray color with this uh, like wood floor and the paint and everything. So that's the kind of motif that we're looking at. But I had this old but high quality bedroom set made by Thomasville. I think it was sold at Ethan Allen back in the day. So it's a very good quality furniture, but it is old. It's about 40, 45 years old. I think it's... Uh, seen better days. It looks good just because on camera everything looks good because it's kind of shiny. But I'll show you in a minute there are some blemishes or some flaws. The finish is flaking off just for it being so old. So this is a good candidate for refinish. If it was junk I wouldn't do it because refinishing, uh, don't kid yourself, is a lot of work. A lot, a lot of work. So you're going to have to do kind of take a look at the quality of the furniture you want to refinish and see if you're going to be up to it if the uh, juice is worth the squeeze on that one. Probably the worst look in refinishing is when somebody leaves the hardware on and they refinish around it. It's blotchy, it looks horrible, and it looks very amateurish. So yes, remove the hardware. Put it in a bag along with the screws so you know where they're all at. You don't want to lose not one piece of it. I also removed the doors and the clips on the inside. And I'm going to leave it together like this while I refinish it just for ease. It's just my personal preference, but what I like to do before I apply any stripper to it is I like to take some green Scotch Brite and scuff the surface up, make some micro uh, scratches in the old finish. To me, in my mind at least, this helps the remover penetrate down through the old finish and down to the wood. The first product that I'm going to try here, I bought a couple. This is Citrus Strip. It's kind of the uh, kinder, gentler stripper, more environmentally friendly. I like to follow the directions because it saves a person a lot of frustration. So right now I'm just brushing it on very liberally on the very top right here, after which I'm going to cover it with plastic because it is a little bit warmer. This keeps the stripper from drying out. I'm going to give this about a good three hours to let it cook underneath of there. And I can rub it and I could see it get a little, a little bit light underneath there so I can tell that the finish is softening up. Here I have some of the tools of the trade, the brush, the scrapers, both plastic and metal. I have a uh, hard bristled brush and I have a different type of stripper there called Clean Strip that I also wanted to try. I've got most of the finish off right here, but I'm going to take and go over the parts that were a little bit stubborn, try to get those off as well. Now I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a very long, tedious process. It's very, very messy and you just got to keep going, keep working at it and you have to wear some safety equipment. You see right here I'm using at least one glove. When it's time to strip I wear two gloves. I have a roll or two of paper towels that after I scrape off that softened finish I have to kind of rub it off of the scraper because it's the consistency, at least on the um, citrus strip, it's like the consistency of tar. So this is a very tedious, um, long, kind of drawn out process. And it, like I said, I like to follow the directions. So it took me several days only because uh, the warmth that we have in Las Vegas. The directions say not to uh, do it if it's over 90 degrees, so I don't do it over 90 degrees. So that limited my time to do this process to the early morning hours Okay, so to finish this up, I have to sand it. So I'm going to use 120 followed up by 220 and both an orbital and a pad sander that you see here. Of course, I use that clean strip after wash to get any residue of any uh, stripper off of there before I began sanding it. So right now I'm all set to go. Okay, so the reason why I use both a random orbital sander and a pad sander is because a random orbital sander spins and it also oscillates. So what that does is it keeps you from having any swirl marks in the wood and it does make quick work of 
sanding off the wood because it gets it from several different angles. Now with this pad sander, the reason why I like it is because it can get into areas that the random orbital sander being round cannot get into, such as you can see I'm here doing the detail work on the drawer fronts, which is about an inch wide strip that I have to get in and get that. Now if I did this by hand, it could be very time consuming, very tedious, but with a pad sander, you know, I just kind of angle it and I follow the curves and it's amazing the places that you can get into with one of these. For parts that were too narrow for both the random orbital and the pad sander, I got this little sanding block in 220 and I just follow the grain back and forth until I can get that off of there. I think it's better to use the smooth side for that. That was a little bit time consuming, but a little hand work never hurts because when it comes to finishing, the probably the best thing you can do for yourself is the prep work. You wanna make sure you get it smooth and you wanna make sure you get all of the old finish off, especially if you're gonna to go to a shade that's lighter than what you have. In my case, I'm gonna go much darker. It's a carbon gray, so still, I wanna make sure I get it off. Now, sanding is another part of the job that's not really that pleasurable. You know, it's, you get dust in your hair and your ears. Uh, you have to wear breathing protection uh, that's loud, so you have to wear ear protection, which is what I'm doing out here right now. But, you know, the thing is, if you're going to get a quality finish, you have to have a smooth surface. And so you're going to have to put in the time on that and get everything uh, right down to what they call in the white or just bare wood. So that way it takes a stain and the finish on it will be superior to one where the finish is rough for sure. For staining I moved operations into the workshop because it's very well insulated and it gives me quite a few more hours on the working time of the stain. Anyway I prepped these two end tables by rubbing them down with mineral spirits. It takes off any leftover residue. And when it dries, I'm gonna go ahead and apply the stain. And what I decided to go with is this Verathane stain, and it's in carbon gray. And I hope I'm gonna like the way that it looks. Looks good on the picture. As a test patch, I decided to go ahead and complete one side of the cabinet just by applying a coat on it seeing what the drying time looks like and what the finish looks like after I wipe it off. So this is like a paint on, let it dry for I think three minutes is what the directions say. Longer if you want a darker finish, less time if you want a lighter finish. And then I'm gonna rub it off with a clean cotton cloth and see how it looks. And I like it, I think I'm gonna go with this. It has just enough show through. So I did the tops and around the drawer fronts I just pull them out staggered like this so I can get to them first. Then after they dry, I'll do the fronts. I'll say that I like this part of finishing because you can see the transformation. I like how it turned out. So I'm gonna work it this way on all the pieces. Now, when I wiped away, if there was a spot that was a little bit too light, I would go ahead and reapply it to just that area, wait a shorter time, maybe like one minute, before wiping it off again so that I can have a nice uniform appearance like what we have right here. Now I moved the large piece into the workshop also and started to work on it and when you do these you want to do like one section at a time and you want to watch the transition points like from the top to the side to make sure you don't get a double dose of finish or make things too dark. But overall I like the way things worked out and while I'm waiting for things to dry I'm going to work on the hardware. It's a personal choice to keep the old hardware and this type of drop down handle is very expensive if you were to buy it. I started out by first rubbing them down with green scotch bright before placing them all in a tub of very hot soapy water to get any oils or residues off of them. Afterwards I gave them a second rub down with that scotch bright before cleaning them off, rinsing them and drying them putting them on a piece of cardboard and painting them in an antique nickel finish that I think is going to go well with that carbon gray. I first put on a couple coats with the handles flipped up before flipping them down and putting on a couple more coats and I must say I really like the way that they turned out. I like the dull or flat finish of it and I think it's going to look good. 
I decided to use both a wipe-on and a brush-on polyurethane for the final finish, but before I do that I like to take uh, some steel wool and just go over the entire piece with the grain to remove any nibs or imperfections in the finish before I go ahead and apply that top coat. Now I like to apply the brush on on the large spaces on the top that are nice and flat and I just do this by loading it up and going across in one direction from end to end before going in the opposite direction end to end at a speed that doesn't allow bubbles to come up then I look at the sheen just to make sure that I have the entire piece covered and I let that dry. I like to use a wipe-on polyurethane for the drawer fronts and all the detail work because it makes it easy to apply it to a small rag and wipe it into all the little recesses and get a smoother finish. I let the piece dry in my shop for about a good three days. It was nice to get away from it for a little while. Then I reinstalled that refinished hardware. And this is a most rewarding part of the whole process because you get to see what it looks like when it's all put back together.